It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the first talk in the Green Talkie series of Wildlife Week 2024. Wildlife Week is the foundation week of uh, the Ecological Society of Isotermandrum, which is a student group of students interested in ecology, natural history, and sustainability. For today's talk, we have Professor Harini Nagendra with us, a luminary in the field of urban ecology and sustainability. Professor Nagendra currently teaches at Azim Premji University and leads the Center for Climate Change and Sustainability. She's a passionate science communicator, policymaker, and as well as author of the historical mystery series, Bangalore Detectives Club. Today, we'll delve dwell deeper into understanding Indian cities as social ecological systems. So before we start, I would like to request everyone to stay on mute during the talk and save your questions till the end. So without further ado, let's welcome a warm welcome. Let's extend a warm welcome to Professor Harini Nagendra. Yeah, the stage is yours. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. I would have liked to be here in person, but since I can't, uh, I should also say it's just very nice to talk to a number of students who have an ecological society. So I didn't know there was a society, ecological society, why that you mentioned. So that's a real pleasure to be here. Yes. Uh, let me see how I can share my yes, present now. That should work, right? Mm. How do I select a tab to share? Ah, yes, okay. Okay, can you see this, the whole screen? Yeah, the screen is visible. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, cities, and since you asked me to talk to, uh, to you about urban ecology, I thought I would talk to you about why we need to look at cities, especially Indian cities as social ecological systems. And you can see the next slide. Yeah, it's visible. Okay, okay. So all is fine then. Okay, so uh, this is a nightlight satellite image, and uh, what it shows you is really urbanization because which parts of the world are going to be lit up at night? Only cities, right? No one, no one else keeps their lights on the whole night. And this is a series of nightlight satellite images, but this is a set from uh, this is a composite from about 2014. And what it shows you is that already by 2014 very large parts of the world are lit up. And if you look at India, and SA especially so, much of India is actually lit up already by 2014. Uh, so the world itself is, um, is more than 50% urban and is going through a massive urban transition. The world will become more than 75% urban by 2050, and India itself is expected to become more than 50% urban by 2050, which is a huge transition. You know, when, uh, when I was in um, uh, about your age and studying in college, they told us that India was 30% urban. I think in the past 30 years, that has moved from 30% to 33%. Not, not a huge difference. But by the time uh, you're uh, maybe giving talks to people in uh, 20, 30 years from now, you're going to have a world that is already much more than 50%. I mean, a country that India is probably going to go from 33% to about 60% urban. So that's, that's a dramatic change. And that means also as ecologists, or people interested in the environment, we need to start taking cities far more seriously. Again, when I'm thinking of when I did my PhD, there was still very much a bias that ecology is a, in India is a, is a study and should be a study of pristine landscapes where human presence is very minimal and anything else that one does is not real ecology. And there was a lot of discussion, but what is real ecology and what are real ecologists? Real ecologists are those who study ecological evolutionary processes in areas where humans don't dominate and don't have a noticeable footprint. We now know that those ideas themselves are were fairly limited because in a country like India, for instance, in the Western Ghats, there has been a human footprint for at least 8,000 years and so, so on in many other parts of the country. So it, looking at areas that are pristine, you know, the idea of pristine itself um, in, in, for instance, in Amazonian forests, which were considered to be pristine, we now know that there were, um, there was a huge amount of urban change like back in the 13th and 14th centuries and civilizations appeared and disappeared. So what we think of as pristine forest once had a very large footprint of with products that moved from different from from the Amazonian forest to different parts of the world. Right. So uh, those ideas themselves may not have even held at, at the point of time they were being talked about. But certainly in India today, one cannot study ecology without studying humans 
and uh, not just in the way that one studies human impact on ecosystems, but also ecosystems impact on society, which is why I call them social ecological systems. Now, if you look at where these cities in them have now moved to the next slide, and you have to tell me if you can't see these. Uh, but so the next slide is uh, again based on UN data, which tells you where are the fastest growing cities in the world. And if you look at the period 1990 to 2014, you see that the growth of cities is completely dominated by the global south. Uh, that is, uh, global south is a, is a word that has no strict definition. It's not the geographic south, though a lot of the global south is the geographic south. It is uh, areas that of uh, in countries that have lower GDPs, lower institutional financial capacity. Uh, you can have areas of the global south within the global north, for instance, uh, less off regions in the US would be south like and you can have areas of the global north within the global south for instance uh, Hong Kong or uh, Tokyo might be southern cities but they're very much like the global north Singapore certainly so the global south is uh, analogous to what one used to call developing countries it's a term that I don't like and I think is now outdated enough that we should just throw it out because what what do we mean by saying India is a developing country? What are we developing on and what have we not developed on, right? So we can debate that. But to call it the global south, it talks really about disadvantages that are often historical, often based in the colonial context of it, in which many of these countries have had to deal with and come to terms with. So they're disadvantaged because of certain things that have happened to them in the past and the structural effects that linger today. If you look at those countries are also countries with very high rates of population growth and that reflects in the growth of cities and you can see therefore that in the growth of cities 1920 to 2014 it's dominated by the reds and yellows which that is the fastest growing cities three to three to five percent growth and more than five percent growth uh, which are all in the global south i mean you can see that clustering very clearly it's also interesting to see that it's not just india but it's countries like india so China, of course, China and India being the two countries that are the fastest growing. Um, just for a second, pause and see if you can think of and make a guess about which is the third fastest growing country in the world in terms of urbanization, the third fastest urbanizing country in the world. India and China, we know, are going to be the top two. What's the third? Right. The third, surprisingly enough, uh, for many of you who might not know, this is Nigeria. And uh, you will see Africa. Africa is urbanizing very fast and large parts of Africa are changing hugely. Now, the context of urbanization in countries, again, most people in the world, what, what's a city? Not anyone in India, but anyone in, let's say, another part of the world. You would probably think of Paris, New York, Hong Kong, Tokyo, maybe a Mexico City or a Bombay or a Delhi. Right. But India contains not just three of the world's largest cities, which are Bombay, Delhi, Calcutta, no surprises there, but also three of the of India's uh, fastest growing cities, you know, kind of cities like uh, uh, Faridabad and Ghaziabad, extremely fast growing. They're very small towns which grew into cities and are growing at an explosive rate. Similarly, a lot of the cities in Africa are growing at huge rate, hugely explosive rates of growth. And the context of urbanization in a country, in a city like Ghaziabad, is so different from a New York. Also, urbanization in countries like India is very different from the West. Very high population densities, small pockets of scattered trees, a very intimate connection to nature that is a continuum from rural areas to urban areas, uh, sacred traditions of worship of nature, and a very um, you find that nature thrives in these very congested urban environments. And why does it thrive? Often because of people in their specific and very peculiar relationship to nature in these cities. And we know nothing about these because all that we know comes from the countries that we think of when we think of urbanization. Here's another map from uh, S3, which talks about growing cities. So this is nightlight satellites images again, but it talks about lights on and lights out. And lights on are areas where there's increasing light coverage of lights over time, which is India, we see blue. And many parts of the US, for instance, this is areas of uh, Texas uh, and many other southeastern parts, uh, southwestern parts of the US, where you will see a lot of de urbanization. Okay. When you look at southeastern parts of the US, and I say de urbanization, it means that these, these uh, cities are, were formerly industrialized cities, and industrial um, companies have moved out, these industrial hubs have moved out, and these cities are kind of collapsing cities. 
where inner cities and the core of the city is becoming more um, taken back by vegetation, if, if you will. You know, that people are living in poverty, people have moved out of the cities. And that's a very different context. Similarly, if you look at a lot of European literature on cities and urban ecology, you will see that a lot of the discussion is around de-urbanization. How are cities in Europe dealing with, with plummeting population rates, with the decrease, with an increasing elderly population, with the fall in the number of the young that you have, and people leaving cities and moving into rural areas. Similarly, in many parts of Eastern Europe. So it's a very different context, not just in terms of population density or income that they have, but also in the terms of the kinds of urbanization. They're dealing with de-urbanization often while we are dealing with urbanization. And so we wrote a paper in 2018. I and colleagues working on uh, China, on Africa, and Latin America. And this came in, uh, it was published in Nature Sustainability. And we talked about the urban south and the predicament of global sustainability. And what we mean by that is that the urban south is so ignored that you can't really understand what's going on in global sustainability because the urban south has this huge footprint. And uh, very interestingly, we got a pushback from referees which said, who said that we don't believe there is such a thing called the urban south because we just we think that it's very similar to patterns in the urban north. Can you justify what you're saying? So we went back and pulled out data. And I'm actually glad that the referees asked us this strange question because we thought the data should be very obvious in showing us differences. And the data was actually very obvious in showing us these differences. But we also realized nobody had ever substantiated these before. So we looked at the percentage increase in population. From the 70s onwards, you can clearly say that uh, the global south, which is the green bus, which we classifying as countries which are transition, developing, and least developed countries from the World Bank classification. We looked at those countries and pulled out all the cities. And then we looked at the other the cities in the developing countries, uh, according to the World Bank classification, and then pulled out their population rates. And you will see that the global south has had higher population rates of growth from the 1970s onwards, which means they're dealing with a very different situation. And how what's their capacity to deal with the situation? Again, looking at UN data, we pulled out data on a number of different uh, aspects related to the environment, to institutions, to financial capacity. So youth unemployment, under five mortality rates, poverty rates, slum household percentages, access to good water, polluted air, PM10 concentrations, internet access, homicide rates, literacy rates. These are all data you can pull out from UN databases. And we divided them into different regions then, because we also wanted to make uh, the argument that the global south is not a homogeneous region. What's going on in Africa is different from what's going on in Asia, which is different from what's going on in Latin America. It's like people who lump Africa into, you know, it's one continent, but Africa has very, very different. It's a continent. It's not a country. And similarly, what's going on in different parts of Asia are very different from each other. And, you know, you can actually disaggregate that further. But to say that Africa, Asia, and Latin America all gets lumped into this homogenous category called the Global South is also not, you know, we wanted to stress that point. And you can clearly see that the Global South deals with much lower rates, you know, so youth unemployment rates are uh, uh, very, very, very much lower, but you also have very high under five mortality rates, very high poverty rates, lots of slum households, uh, very, very poor access to water, very high levels of air concentration, uh, for polluted air uh, concentration, and rates of violence. For instance, in Africa, rates, homicide rates are very high, and so they're dealing with urban governance in a situation where homicide rates are high, access to the internet is low, poor, there's very bad quality of water, very bad quality of air, and very high growing up and uh, growing uh, and fast exploding urban populations. How are they supposed to govern these? What do they do to govern their cities? When you look at this, you think that there should be a lot of data on, in this context because we need to know how to govern these cities with data that comes from their peculiar context, right? But where's the data? We then did another analysis, which was quite exhaustive, where we looked at a decade of work. So this paper was published in 2017, 18. And so we took the top 1,000 urban sustainability papers from a decade. And when I say the top 1,000, I mean the top 1,000 citation-wise. So we looked at uh, Google Web of Scho uh, Science, uh, not Google, Web of Science, and used keywords related to urban sustainability and pulled out the top 1,000 papers. So that's a large data set. And then we looked at who are the, where are the authors coming from? 
and the authors coming for largely 70% of the authors came from north america and europe we've also done this by where are what are the areas they're studying the cities that they're studying and it's a very similar graph i'm not showing that to you here so 70% of the authors and 70% of the data studied either comes from global cities global analyses or from global north analyses papers that are from the global south are 0.5%. So India, other global south and South Africa. We're leaving out China here because 20% of the papers are by Chinese authors on China. And China is a very peculiar case. You can call it global south, but it's really an institutional context of its own, where urbanization is so tightly driven by the government that you can't really compare what's going on in China to what's going on in any other part of the world. Right? So you can't learn lessons from Chinese urbanization to apply to India or to South Africa or any other part of the world. However, so we, what, do we, what are we left with? In these thousand papers, top cited thousand papers, which means they're the most influential papers driving urban policy, driving urban action, because we know that this kind of research clearly drives action. 10, 10 out of the thousand come from India. Maybe another 35 come from other India-like global south context. So what are we dealing with? We're dealing with a huge, 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 massive gap of information. And this leads to certain which is, for instance, smart city approaches, which are tech focused or other kinds of approaches which come directly imported from contexts like New York or Israel or Hong Kong or uh, Paris, which don't apply in the Indian context. So what do we have in this terms of this data? So this is where I want to situate some of the work we've been doing. Now, I started doing my work on Indian cities in 2005. I started, I started my PhD research in 1993. And from 93 to 2005, 2006, I worked extensively on forests and institutions, land cover change, forest change, biodiversity. And I've been very interested always in understanding ecology as a social ecological system. That is, people influence ecology and ecology influences people. And so people can be positive agents of change. We see that clearly in forest context. They're not just agents of degradation, but also you find community groups that conserve forests, regenerate forests. Uh, maintain them traditionally, uh, and you can see all of this very clearly. And my work looked at what are the conditions that facilitate that. But by 2005, 2006, I was looking at Bangalore and seeing that this massive change in the city. And I realized, you know, by 2050, look at the statistics we have here. India is going to have 60% urban population. It's going to add 415 million people. 1,800 people now move to cities every hour. And Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata by 2050 are going to be more than 100 million in size. How are we going to deal with all of this? Nobody seems to be looking at it from an ecological or an environmental point of view, except complaining that, oh, pollution is very bad. We should do something about it. Oh, solid waste is very bad. We should do something about it. We need a lot of scientific studies to understand how people consume, how people waste, what do people do with biodiversity, what kind of... Conditions help to facilitate people's conservation in the city. But I didn't start all my urban ecology work with that. Though I have to say that in 2006, I started more as a citizen of 2005, 2006. Bangalore was losing a lot of trees, a lot of the lakes, uh, and citizen movements were gaining, gaining force. And they were looking for some kind of data and some scientists to help them. And so I started with that, with working with a bunch of students to say, let's do informal assessments of, OK, trees are going to be cut lakes are going to be filled in what's the environmental impact of this then we were approached by the government to say can you help us with some of these uh, you know the, the lake planning can you in, in some parts of the city can you show us how to restore and rejuvenate lakes so we started we moved to that and then it slowly spread and has now become 80 percent of what i do in terms of uh, my own work and it's not just Bangalore, of course, we work with Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata, Hyderabad, um, smaller cities uh, across India. And we're now doing a, a lot of climate analysis as well as environmental and ecological analysis. But today I want to talk to you mainly about issues uh, that I find in Bangalore. So Bangalore, like other cities, cities are supposed to be engines of growth, economic growth, but also they all you see that because of the rapid growth, you have issues like water pollution, heat islands, flooding, air pollution, and of course now climate change. And so it's very clear that it should be very clear that cities can't survive if they ignore ecology. And you need to understand urban ecosystems to understand global well-being. 
sadly though this is not something that planners or regular residents of most cities recognize or accept because when you talk to them the uh, you know i will go back always to a man that uh, made a huge impression on me when we started sometime in 2006 7 rotary club was doing a seed ball planting exercise across bangalore and it was one of their massive exercises where they would encourage citizens to take seed balls and just throw them across the city wherever they went and uh, with the expectation that trees would grow and now of course we know that uh, and we knew it even then that uh, you know seed balls are this kind of uh, this is not the best way to be in the city there must there have to be better ways but also it was something that they were doing by putting in a lot of effort and they had a, a large public event to talk to people about uh, seed balling and to talk to people more importantly about urban ecology and the importance of trees and so that at least that part of it seemed like a worthy initiative and a number of ecologists went to give talks and uh, in that audience one man got up and spoke in Canada and he said uh, very sarcastically that all you luminaries are standing on stage and you're telling us uh, how we should care about trees and trees are good and trees give you shade and trees give you fruit and trees give you uh, so many other things and it's very important to have trees. I'm going to tell you that uh, you don't need to tell me all of this, uh, which idiot doesn't like trees? Okay. <laughs> That's the literal translation of what he said, which idiot doesn't like trees. And he said, look, I'm a pune in Vidhan Sauda, which is the legislative assembly in Bangalore. And I need to get to work every day. And I sit in the bus and your trees block my road. And because of your trees, I get to work late. And if I get 15 minutes to work, uh, if I come to work late by 15 minutes, then I get docked a half day pay. And so you can have your trees in the forest. We, anyone who wants to have trees and is worried about biodiversity can go and visit the trees outside on weekends, but uh, take your trees out of my city. And you don't have to tell me why I should love trees. Everybody loves trees. It's just that there's no place for trees in the city. And we found as we started talking to people that many, many, many people share his attitude. The, the fraction of people who understand why you need to have trees in cities is very small, actually. And so we are doing a very bad job of communication if we are sticking to the fact that we are appealing to moral virtue and compassion and kindness and, uh, you know, the, the importance of trees. So how do we get to a larger audience? And this has been really a large focus of my work post that for the past 15, 20 years, looking at urban, at communication of urban uh, social ecological systems. It's a, it's a mouthful when you talk about urban social ecological systems. It can be a mouthful even for students in classes. And so how do you communicate something like this, which is so complex to a popular or a wider audience? Along the way, a lot we've done a lot of different things. Uh, we've had a lot of students, a lot of this, much of the work that I'm speaking to you about is student driven. And we've had undergraduate interns all the way to postdocs and, uh, you know, and very large teams of people working on this. But I want to highlight three things when you're talking about the data, where's the data issue that three things that we have found of the many things that we have found uh, three stories that I want to tell you that are important uh, findings that tell you also how Indian cities like Bangalore work, but they'll also tell you how little we know and how despite our work for 18 years and the close to 100 publications, I would think that have now come out of these of this work. Uh, how we've still scratched the surface and this work and our work in other cities, how we've the surface of urban ecology in India. So there's much, much to be done. And I hope many of you go on to do further work in this area. So let's start with a map of Bangalore. Okay, this is a map. And uh, along the way, I want you to see how we use GIS, remote sensing, biodiversity studies, interviews, uh, then uh, eBird data, bird observations, songs of the lake. We use, we've used songs and you know to, to study oral histories. We have used um, archival work. We have done oral histories. We've done all kinds of things. So it's a very problem focused approach where we're using every method we can. And the other thing I would encourage you to be is therefore not restricted to the methods that you know, but restricted to the pro think of it as a problem you want to work on. The methods will come later. And the methods are uh, something you can always learn, but always have a problem centered approach. What is the question that you really want to ask? And that should drive the choice of problems. Often we do it differently. We know a set of methods and we're comfortable with these methods. So we're we're a hammer searching for a nail to hit, and we really look at need to look at the nail and see what are the different kinds of hammers we should be bringing to this. Okay. 
So we started with Bangalore, and uh, this is a map of the growth of Bangalore uh, by my colleague H. Sudira. And it starts with the, you know, the, the small area in 1537, which was the town built by Kempe Kaura, the first ruler of Bangalore. But if you look at the history, the conventional history is that Kempe Kaura came to this barren land and created this town market town called Bangalore. But the ecological history is much older, and you find a lot of inscription stones across this landscape. So I took these inscription stones and uh, mapped their location and tried to understand how this landscape grew. And what we find was that many of these areas that we call Bangalore's lakes now were originally irrigation tanks. And they were created by local communities and by people for various reasons, for the support of the goddess, for merit to the afterlife. They were, some were created by kings, some by commoners of various kinds. You know, for instance, there's a lake called Suli Kunde, and this is where you gain your ecological information from, sometimes from all kinds of sources. So Suli means in Canada prostitute. So you you know that common people of all kinds were creating these lakes and restoring them for the community. And so it was not just gods and kings that were, I mean, it's a kingly uh, thing, uh, people that were doing this and for the service of gods, but it was all kinds of uh, communities that were also restoring lakes. These lakes were created as commons lands always. And you can see this from, for instance, this lovely land grant where a lake has been created. And then the grant of the lake and the fertile lands, the wet and the dry lands, the wetlands being paddy cultivation and the dry lands being ragi or millet cultivation, including the wells underground and the trees overground, which is such a beautiful three-dimensional visualization or imagination of a landscape. Who in today's world would talk about a survey document and say the wells below the ground and the trees above the ground are part of this landscape? But in inscription after inscription, you will he see this land grant which talks about the village, uh, the boundaries of the village, as well as the wells underground and the trees above ground. So these are common lands which are used by communities. And what you see is that this kind of a landscape was very dry initially. And people, as they came in over time, built and created many more lakes and many more uh, planted many more trees. However, what you see by 2015 is that this is the landscape of Bangalore, which is covered by trees because the trees were planted and lots of them were planted during the British uh, period. But many of the lakes have disappeared. You have only one lake in the heart of the city. And what you can trace that to, again, I'm not going into detail because there's too much work actually to cover in a 50 minute talk. But uh, a lot of it can be traced to the fact that once the local loop of self-dependence was broken, that is still until 1890s, people depended on the lakes within the boundaries of Bangalore for water. And so they protected the lakes, they preserved them, there were goddesses, they were worshipped, the lake was desilted, there was an entire elaborate program of treating the water in the lake. But the moment uh, in 1892, piped water started coming in from distant water sources, you can suddenly see a change where lakes are now called cesspools of malaria and were cleaned up or filled in or you know closed and no longer were available as these spaces for the community. Until what happens about a few years ago is that you start seeing a lot of drought again in the area. And so water dries up and communities come together because they know they start recognizing that if the lakes have dried up and disappeared, this means that the groundwater goes down, and this means that they who are dependent on groundwater supply are not going to get their supply. And so lakes start getting restored by communities and by the government, and you see a lot of lake restoration in Bangalore especially. However, what, because people are not looking at this as social ecological systems, they're only looking at these lakes as pure ecological systems, and their idea of what a pure ecological system is, is very flawed. They don't understand that these lakes have developed relationships with people over time. So for instance, one of the first things they do is to close the boundaries of the lake and throw out the grazers. The second thing that they do is to bypass the sewage that flows into the lake and send it into a sewage treatment plant. And because sewage treatment plants are expensive, every three, four lakes, you'll treat the water and then release that into the lake. Now, two, three things happen. Firstly, that the sewage that flows into the water into a drain is actually it's a storm water drain it's a rainwater system and water originally flowed into this system and now sewage flows in because people have let in sewage into the lake right and what has happened is we have not planned for our rainwater uh, well so they've been blocked in places and so we've blocked the path of rainwater which no longer flows into these areas people send their drains into these areas but by block blocking 
by diverting the water into sewage treatment plants, by diverting the sewage into sewage treatment plants, what you're doing is also removing the little bit of rainwater that did flow into the lake. So you're starving the lake of water. Secondly, apartments around and industries around the lake are still going to illegally pump in sewage in the middle of the night, and they all do that. So every lake is going to have some sewage in an Indian city. What happens with sewage? You can treat it with a sewage treatment plant or not treat it with a, or it could be untreated sewage. Either way, it's going to have nitrogen and phosphorus because the sewage treatment plant is not going to treat you of nitrogen and phosphorus. Moment you have that, what you have, you have plant growth. And therefore, you have eutrophication and you have your salvia or other kinds of, um, you know, uh, exotic weed plants which come and cover the surface of the lake. And then you have the lake starved of oxygen and then you have massive uh, fish deaths and turtle deaths and, you know, whatever else in the water. What happens if you have cows? If the cows are going to eat the grass. There's going to be more native grass flourishing because that's what the cows that, and that growth, that's a cooperative system, right? That's a cooperative system that encourages the growth of these grasses. And then the cows are going to eat the grass. So you're going to have a natural clearing out of this grass and the nitrogen and phosphorus out of the system. Similarly, there were dhobis and migrant workers and women like this who used to take weeds and harvest weeds from the lake bed. And when you remove all of them, you've removed and gundatops, which are these sacred trees that were on the lake bed. And then when you remove them and you convert these into jogging and walk, walking paths and a beautified lake, so there's beautification of the lake, what you get is a very sim it's a simplification of the social ecological relationships and it simplifies the ecology because what you do is bring in exotic species and landscape parks. And, you know, for instance, people bring in uh, lantana rather than having nat native species. You have a cement bund and you don't have the ecology that once was flourished on the side of the, the bund. You've concretized the wetland. So, so much simplification, not only of the biodiversity, but also of the social ecological system itself. So what uh, one of the things we find clearly in our studies from Bangalore, which pertains to all Indian ecosystems, is that we can't value ecology purely in ecological economics terms of monetary value, because that fits biodiversity against economic growth. We need to have a multi-dimensional appreciation of value. And especially in Indian cities, ecosystems are commons. And we are actually only focusing on the regulatory ecosystem services. And we are focusing on the um, rec recreational ecosystem services. We forgot to focus on the provisioning services and importance of ecosystems for spiritual and sacred needs and mental and physical health. They're not just recreational spaces, they're provisioning services, firewood, fuel wood, fishing, grazing. These are the poor that come in, but it's it's not just the poorest and the most vulnerable in cities, but they're also allies in conservation because we have seen in lake after lake that when the fishers are there at the boundaries of the lake, they want to protect their fish. So they're camping there at night and they are the ones who are the first line of defense between real estate developers that encroach into the lake or apartments that let in waste at night or any other kinds of you know damage to the lake and so if you lose the grazers and the fishers you're losing traditional knowledge of the lake and you're losing allies who are very important so again this lack of knowledge of a social ecological system that is an ecosystem in lakes and in lakes and in parks i can take the same what you have instead is the government coming in with signs like this saying no flower plucking, no grazing, no swimming, no physical interaction with the lake of any kind. And if you don't have that physical interaction, where are you going to have physical and mental health? You know, forget any of the provisioning services that I'm talking about. The engagement that people had, direct engagement from with the lake, does not come if you only walk and jog around this in a sanitized way using your binoculars and doing bird watching. You have to have a physical engagement with the lake. We found also, so when we when we started with this, we went to the policymakers and a lot of them said nobody forages for greens anymore. And you're talking about old things in Bangalore. Bangalore is a modern city. So we looked at a very recent, recent study and uh, we looked at uh, respondents from low income homes uh, in Bangalore and women. There's 200 women of whom 16% foraged for food, but 47% purchased forage species from local markets. They purchased and used 76 different kinds of species, just 202 women. And we found clearly that it was getting excluded again in the city center. As lakes get restored, they create boundaries, gates, guards, timings, and a list of do's and don'ts. You can't even photograph, for instance. You can't take photographs uh, with cameras in the heart of the city in parks and lakes anymore, because that's also forbidden. So the kinds of, you can't take pets, for a walk. So 
the the kinds of uses and the exclusion of these lakes it's, we talk about protected areas and there's a lot of work about the exclusionary way in which pas are uh, managed in india well city city ecosystems are not managed in any less exclusionary ways right and so you find all of these studies that there are many more we have looked at the loss of trees on uh, roads on parks and changes in apartment complexes but this is the first lesson of our you know what what do we know from these indian cities the largest lesson is that when you do restoration you must look at them as commons and social ecological systems not as public goods you must have a priority on integrating diverse cultural views and you can't do private closure of these parks you must uh, with gates and tickets and guards and expecting return on investments these are commons and must be maintained as commons the second is on how cities absorb the second lesson that we have is uh, and i'll go a little faster here because i know we're getting to the end of the i want to wrap up in the next 10 minutes on the importance of these ecosystems in cities as for place making and environmental stewardship because a lot of the again this came from questions that i got from audiences and uh, sometimes my best research uh, come, uh, directions come from these questions and someone asked me once at um, a talk that uh, you aren't you giving us a lament of commons lost what's the hope for indian cities going forward and now we see around us that there are communities coming together to conserve lakes to conserve parks the ra forest that south delhi uh, landscapes they're not all locals it's not a, the old commons that they're preserving many of them are migrants to the city of various kinds and so we got curious when does a migrant say that the city is their own let's say someone comes into bangalore when does the city become their own city so much so that they are willing to do something to protect that city now we found that if you look at kaikondrali lake which is the lake that i have worked on in terms of both being a citizen involved in the restoration and being an ecologist and you can clearly see that the groups that came together for the protection of kaikondrali lake did not know each other before this but after this have gone on to work on solid waste management on traffic on um, go in government schools on waste management on all kinds of different uh, challenges urban challenges because they got together and met at the lake and could go on to do different things so what is it about a lake or an urban ecosystem that makes people feel a part of the city in a way that a mall will never you will never say i go to a mall every day and that makes me feel like this is bangalore because a mall is a decontextualized place So we did a, some interviews. Uh, this is work with Amrita Sen, uh, who was a postdoc with us and is now a faculty member at IIT Kharagpur. And uh, she interviewed about a hundred different diverse lake visitors and users at three or four different restored lakes in uh, south uh, west southeast Bangalore. And she found a number of different groups. For instance, the migrant workers in this top photo are climate refugees from North uh, Karnataka. Their areas have dried up and they've come here, but they would rather work in this lake where they got a thousand rupees less. every month then the construction sites just across the road you can see one of them on the other side of the wall so just like us they want their children to grow up in greener safer cleaner healthier environments uh, we found a mother of a differently able child who said that she values the lake because her child can get rid of his excess energy and his mood is much happier when he goes to school and therefore she's also happier we found corporate employees who come to the lake in the evenings to have a cup of tea before they get back into their it caves because they can uh, feel more relaxed we found transgender people who said that they want to sit at the lake and the bench to relax because the lake doesn't judge them the way people at the lake judge them from outside and we found uh, deep bhagyama the lady below who is the child of the lake she is not migrant she was from the village that was all this is an original custodian of the lake and she continues to maintain Uh, so she's from a dalit community and she continues to be the one in the in the brahmin temple of today maintaining the original lake deity the uh, dugalama who is the lake goddess because she says dugalama she her community was the one which traditionally looked after the dugalama stone and once she came into a temple dugalama wants her to look after her so if anyone else comes to clean up dugalama and this is where caste collides with uh, ownership with traditional approaches to management but her claim is that when other brahmin priests came to look after dugalama their hands they broke their hands they slipped they fell they had various accidents so bhagyama is still the one who looks after dugalama even though dugalama is now in a temple and no longer at the side of the lake and these are the social ecological systems that we need to understand because when we walk went for a walk with Duga, with uh, bhagyama around the lake she told us about nine different large open wells 
which were not in any official records of the lake. And she said, this one is, you know, uh, uh, the site of where there was a two groups that fought and some some people were killed and thrown into the well. We never went there. And that's the, now the tennis park of a large apartment. You, know. you can't see any of these, but you know that somewhere the underground water dynamics must be reflecting these the existence of these large wells. And perhaps we can revive some of them, right? So we get insights into new ecological wisdom by talking to these people. Similarly, Amrita and I did a series of studies where we did songs of the lake and we interviewed women. And these songs give you oral histories of the landscape around them, but they also tell you about how women transmit memories through these oral ecologies. And finally, because this was the extreme anthropological end, the songs and the communities, I want to give you something with the GIS and the urban ecology. So this is work I did in collaboration with uh, um, Ravi Jambekar, who was then a postdoc with us, and Kulu, Kulpush and Surya Manchi from uh, Nature Conservation Foundation where we wanted to look at what's the impact of lake restoration on biodiversity of birds in Bangalore. And we took eBird data because eBird data is abundant and easily available. And we used distance as a proxy for, uh, uh, so, so space as a proxy for time. Essentially what we did was we took the lake and at different distances to the lake, we saw what was the biodiversity. And we said that as, uh, so this gives us a sense of lake restoration because the lake, if the restored lake is important, then you have much more biodiversity in the lake as a, compared to the areas outside the lake as you go further away from the lake. Right? So we did this study and we looked at changes and what we found is that resident bird populations increased over time as, um, as, you, as you, you came closer to the lake. Right? So where's, where are, yes. So um, I'm yeah, coming back to this graph. Yes, so resident bird populations, presence of a restored lake certainly positively affects resident bird populations. Except for some cases, for instance, the purple heron has gone down over time, and then you see that uh, the pheasant tail jacana has gone down, and then you see the pied kingfisher has gone down. And we have certain hypotheses over this. The lesser whistling duck has reduced. Our hypotheses are really hypotheses at this, at this point, and we need to study this far more, but we think it's the way in which these lakes were restored. For instance, uh, you have uh, feral dogs that can come in easily. So if you have the purple heron nesting, you could the, the dogs and cats can come in and you know destroy the nest. But you also find that certain other species, because this, the banks of the lake used to be muddy and now concretized, you find that that has also changed the ecology of the lake. That's the in the in the details. But big picture, resident birds have been improved by the creation of by the restoration of lakes. Migratory birds have been affected. Why are migratory birds affected? It's very clear because the migratory birds are responding to so much else that's going on. It's it's not local. It, you can't do much with just restoring a lake and fix migratory bird issues. It's the entire chain of migration that matters. But this still gives us some sense of what we need to do in terms of restoration. Certain species are getting affected. How do we restore the lakes to maintain those species of the kind? Right? This so now where's the data? I came back to uh, ask you the question of what's the, where's the data, and we came back to these three things: lakes as social ecological systems and commons, the importance of lakes uh, in making people feel a sense of place, migrants to belong to the city, and then come together for urban conservation. And then finally, how do you restore lakes, and what kinds of species are coming back of birds, and what kinds of species are disappearing? But you can see that we've scratched the surface. There's so much more, not just in terms of different cities. And I'd be happy to talk about uh, some of the work that we done in cities, other cities, if you want, in, in question and answers. For instance, Kolkata and the East Kolkata wetlands we've been looking at in the Yavar in Delhi. There are very different stories that we get as we start looking at different cities. But also, even in Bangalore, we scratch the surface. Just as we start looking at one paper, five other questions pop up. So I think the world is really open for these kinds of questions. And we need to look at these, uh, look at the field of urban ecology far, far more in detail than we have. So I'll recap just saying that as scientists, there's much to study, but also as people engaging with the world. I think all of us, if we're interested in ecology and the environment, this is no longer an academic field of study, if it ever was. We need to urgently communicate this to people because the world is changing around us and we need to explain to them why you need ecology, not just in cities, but everywhere. You know, I can give you one example. India is going to be ground zero for uh, climate change. And uh, we looked at climate resilience and city adaptation plans in India. This is work by Hita, former PhD student of mine, uh, now in Sheffield and, and myself. And we found that nature based solutions are really being pushed in a number of cities. but 
the involvement of communities is not there at all. This is not decentralized. This is just being pushed by the idea. And the idea of nature-based solutions is very technocentric. It's really, I mean, for them, for instance, eucalyptus could be a tree as much as a native species could be a tree. So that kind of talking to communities and understanding what nature-based solutions really should be is not there in any of these plans. This is just one example. I want to wind up here also by saying that a lot more of the detail that is there in this work is in the first book that I wrote, Nature in the City, uh, Bangalore in the Past, Present and Future, which is in 2016. Uh, also, the more popular books that we've done, which is uh, with Seema Mundoli, my colleague, and myself, on Cities and Canopies on Trees in Indian Cities, which is a popular book at, on trees. Shades of Blue, which is a recent book of Penguin, Penguin with, uh, which is on water issues across Indian cities. But also a number of other publications. For instance, uh, when we were, did the work on foraging, we also came up with a book called Chasing Sopu, Sopu being greens in, uh, in Canada. And uh, with lovely artwork by Rohit Rao, who was one of the collaborators on this work, and that book has been released. Uh, similarly, Where Have All Our Gundatops Gone is a bilingual Kannada English book that we have on based on the Gundatops or the wooded groves across Karnataka, and uh, which has 6,500 copies have gone into panchayat libraries across Karnataka so that children, school children can use these. And So Many Leaves is a children's book we wrote with Pratham, which is now translated into eight different languages. Right? So, and also, you know, as a side, since uh, you know that I write uh, fiction and the Bangalore Detectives Club series, one thing I really did not expect is how writing these books broadens the connection to ecology and the reach and access I have to a very large group of people who don't read nonfiction. But through the books, I can tell them the importance of ecology with a very soft touch. And uh, through that, you know, to my latest book, the book four that I'm writing in the series now is uh, looking at the plantations of food, where I'm going to talk about man-animal conflict and the colonial footprint of plantations and how that changed the ecology and the landscape of that entire region. And then I can talk about the commoditization of crops, the exploitation of people, and the entire so the change in the social ecological systems of the cool landscape that happened. So one needs to write, and I think one needs to write all kinds of when read and write and speak and communicate. And those some of you might be good at YouTube videos, some of you might be doing podcasts, others might do street theater. Whatever it is, we need to reach larger communities than we're reaching because I think I fear very much that we are right now top reaching within the choir, talking to small groups of, of people, while the scale of the problem is so huge and most people are going around their uh, daily work completely unaware of the crises, multiple crises that we have facing us today. So yeah, with that, uh, I'll end with this lovely picture of uh, how do we build a pluralistic city that's a social ecological system. This is work by Rohit Rao, who was then an undergraduate intern when he drew this lovely photograph for us, um, lovely uh, cartoon for us. And I'll stop here. And I'm happy to answer questions. Now. Yeah, thanks for this wonderful talk. I think it's really been inspiring for all of us. So first, we'll just look for people who have questions. So anybody who has questions, please like unmute yourself or send them in the chat. Um, hi, Harini. Uh, am I audible? Uh, great talk. Um, so I wanted to ask, how do you think a city retains its, its identity? Like now with uh, more and more exotic trees coming in and uh, like more and more exotic trees are coming into the urban areas, uh, like rain trees and all of that. Um, I also remember attending a talk uh, that you delivered at ISC where you mentioned that now rain trees, like the ecosystem have, Indian ecosystem or the urban ecosystem has accepted rain trees. But still, do you think that... Uh, um i don't know like i use i'm using identity as like very vaguely but uh, how do you think uh, the cities might retain their identities and when do you think the cities will lose their identity mm -hmm. in a sense it's a lovely question i it's always that it's a very large question and difficult to answer uh to me it's some of these identities have evolved over time if you look at delhi and bangalore they were semi-arid landscapes and they didn't have trees. So to go back to what the original identity of Delhi or Bangalore would be, you need to remove all the trees and bring back thorny bushes. But you can't do that because it's an altered uh, system now because we've got all this concrete. 
And so you need to cool the concrete. Otherwise, people can't live here. Right. And so uh, what you have is somewhat, uh, it's, it's really an altered, these are novel social ecological systems. So if you look at the framework and you look up, you know, literature on novel social ecological systems, uh, for instance, the bunny grasslands have been divided, uh, described as a novel social ecological system because of all the invasive prosopis. But the invasive prosopis has become part of that landscape because people have been using it. Now that's since the 1970s. Uh, rain tree and many of these other trees in the landscape of Bangalore or the other trees that you find in the landscape of Delhi have been around for 150 years, 200 years since the British planted them. And that's even longer of a social ecological evolution. So that's, I would say, the part of character of Bangalore and Delhi. If you take out the rain trees, Bangalore is not going to be Bangalore. That said, when does the city lose its identity? I think when the ecosystems go away. So if the lakes of Bangalore disappear, if the East Kolkata wetlands disappear, if the Arala Valley is completely, you know, decimated, mined and blasted and converted into apartments all the way, I think then you know, Delhi is not going to be Delhi without the Aravalis and the Yamuna. And Bangalore won't be Bangalore without its lakes. And uh, Bombay won't be Bombay without its salt flats and the mangroves. And, uh, you know, similarly, uh, Kolkata won't be the same without the East Kolkata wetland. So that to me is the heart of the city. What, what is the ecosystem itself? This is a lovely right. question. Yeah, so like there needs to be a constant effort for like uh, by the people of the city to like uh, to have it retain its identity. Like yes. um, cities still need a uh, lake restoration. So like it's not like it's naturally there. There still exactly. needs the restoration. Yes, and yes like exactly. That. It is naturally there. The, the tragedy also then becomes that, yeah, it's naturally there and one needs to maintain it because uh, because uh, uh, the our idea of urban development is so un unilaterally focused on on infrastructure growth that there's always going to be threats to it. And so you know you can save RA today, for instance, or tomorrow it doesn't be a new plan. Or you can save the, the Bellari Road from tre uh, trees today, and then uh, tomorrow there's going to be a new plan to cut it down for a flyover, or an underpass, or a metro, or something. And then you have to create a new set of uh, initiatives, then to oppose it, and then you might you know protect it for three to five years, and then there's going to be some new project again that comes along. So that's really also why one needs to keep you're running to save stay in the same place because new plans are constantly coming up. All right, thank you. Good evening. Yeah. Um, I don't know how uh, like a complex question this would be, but I just had this idea that only these uh, technologies and everything are contributing to the urbanization or even the agriculture or increase in the agricultural maybe activities also contribute to uh, maybe the cause of losing a lot of forest and stuff. So is it that agriculture can also be a major concern? Uh, yes and no, in the sense that all cities have a lot of agriculture, but if you look at, so this is not our work, but work by Bhartendu Pandey and Karen Seto uh, from Yale had shown that the when cities expand, they are expanding into agriculture. So in fact, the largest land cover change that is happening because of urban expansion is a loss of agriculture, not the expansion of agriculture. So I would say, yes, certain kinds of intensive agriculture are a problem, but um, not so much in cities. Construction, urban construction and urban dust is, is really the main problem that one sees. Yes. Uh, hi, Harini. It was a lovely talk. Uh, so I wanted to ask, like, uh, if you look into the cities, it's mostly driven by the global culture rather than uh, rural uh, cultural setup where people are more in uh, touch with the, their surroundings. But uh, if you look into the cities, it's not the case. And uh, we have seen many generations uh, that might not be like the current generation might not have the knowledge of their uh, surroundings or something. So do you think in a future we have uh, hope that we can retain some of those uh, past uh, cultural values that we had for our surroundings in the cities i think i mean looking at our interviews we see a surprising persistence of ecological memory 
I think it's just not in some some uh, socioeconomic classes. But if you take the social, like look at the 202 women we interviewed. 202 women know about 76 species, forage with them regularly, eat them regularly. That was not what we expected. So I mean, even we thought it was high, but we didn't expect it to be that high. So I think the, the survival of that memory is, is high. It gets transmitted and passed on. What we need to be doing with people like us, so students in colleges and uh, you know um, uh, students where you are places where you have upward mobility, you have a little more wealth, is to find other ways to transmit this. So for instance, one of the things we were thinking is what what if one made a repository of the songs of the lake and set up uh, weekend cl classes, let's say in Kavan Park, where these women would come and teach others the songs of the lake that they need. You know, or what what happened if let's say in Lalbag or Kappan Park, which is where you, when you have you know we we use these women as uh, for uh, menial tasks like sweeping and cleaning, but they're actually having a lot of ecological knowledge which we don't have. So what if they took classes? I mean, like in Delhi you have in Lodi Gardens uh, five star sh hotel chefs who come and do these urban foraging classes. They charge huge amounts of money, and then you can cook with fresh produce that you collect locally. They, these women should be doing the classes for us, right? And uh, showing us what what uh, sopo they can collect from different parts of the garden. So can we think of ways in which, again, as ecologists, we invert that pyramid of hierarchy where we are not the, the scientifically trained ones imparting our wisdom to people, but people who have this, you know, like you're saying, Sanat, the, the actual ecological cultural traditions that they have, can we find a way for them to teach the rest of us? So I think we have to find those ways and there are audiences now who are looking for those and they would be very keen to do to take them on. The you know finding the giving these people the platform that's something that we need to think about how we can do that. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Hello. Yes. Uh, firstly, thank you for the wonderful talk. I got so many new insights. It was really interesting. Uh, I have two kind of interconnected questions. So first, I'm curious to know that uh, why did you have urban area as the focus of uh, your previous research when we consider human uh, settlements as socio-ecological systems? And second was how are rural socio rural areas in terms of social or ecological systems different or similar to urban and how can they both provide uh, mutual learning or challenges you know okay. so why urban as social ecological systems i think in the urban it becomes especially apparent because you can't take away the social from the ecological you know in rural areas nature often springs up on its own or was formed by the geology the landscape and you know, just the soil and everything else interacting. But often you have, I mean, most of the vegetation in cities exist because it was planted. And it was planted because people had a certain perception of what they wanted to be planted in the city. And that, again, the flora that you plant shapes the fauna, shapes the insects, shapes the microorganisms. So in a city, I think the social cannot be separated from the ecological at all because the social shapes the ecological so very strongly not just from the destruction part, but also the creation part, right? So that's, that's why, you know, cities, I think it's very important. But uh, rural areas, it's very different. It, it, the more homogeneous, I would say, more easy to study because in, a, in an urban, what is the community? Not that what defining a community in a rural is easy because there's still caste, class, gender, all kinds of divisions. But in a city, it's completely chaotic. Well, who is the community that accesses a lake? There's so many communities, each with disparate um, desires, wants, needs, and histories, and they bring their own. So understanding social ecological systems in a city, both and also from the governance point of view, the governance is very fragmented. You know, it's not just the panchayat. Uh, this is the one group that uh, owns the lakes, one group that owns the wastewater, one group that owns the rainwater, one group that manages the, pol the policing one that does the revenue, one that does the municipality. And so if you have to work on protection, it's crazy because you have to work with all these diverse institutions and they are often at cross talks. And so they do a very nice passing of the buck to each other. And that all becomes very challenging. So I would say working in a city has been far more challenging and complex than working in rural areas. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so we're not able to hear you. Um, there's another question in the chat, if you could just yeah, have a I'll just there. answer that last question and then I do need to step off. But uh, so what yeah. is, yeah, Vidya's, um, how, so I'll just read that out for people. The ecological resources historically developed, such as lakes, etc., due to how the society's economy transforms, say the trade and exchange systems. Uh, lakes were important for farming and trade. It's the economy which changes the identity of the city. So, for instance, Bangalore is now IT city. So that's an important framework to see how that impacts the ecology. ecology. So can we say it's social and economic perspectives of the city needs to be explored? Absolutely. When I'm using the word social, I'm using it in a very broad uh, meaning, which I mean the social incorporates for me uh, aspects of the economic, aspects of institutions, aspects of... Uh, uh, culture, aspects of history, all of that comes in social. So the social ecological systems also as a, as a framework, the social ecological systems framework explicitly accounts for all of these as well as globalization. And so that's that you're right. It is, uh, especially in cities, it's the econo economy that is uh, hugely transformative. And that is something one needs to look at very clearly. Yeah. So thanks for joining us today. And um, it's been wonderful knowing about how to look at things through multiple perspectives and finding different answers. I'm looking for different questions, in fact. And uh, yeah, thanks for sharing your stories and experiences and your knowledge with us. And thanks for everybody else for joining us today.